Within our words, an unseen power is set in motion. The tongue is a small thing, but, like a tiny spark, can set a great force on fire. Once spoken, our words begin blazing a trail through the hearts and lives of those around us. One kind word can demolish guilt. It can inspire hope. But the same words have also embraced hatred and executed innocence. Once spoken, our words scorch their feelings and emotions on a level that only they can produce. Your words set up a chain of events beyond your control and of which you will never know. One word can destroy beliefs, harden hearts, or cultivate hatred. But they can also demonstrate faith, display forgiveness, and nurture love. The power of life and death lies in a single word, and we, the image of God, have this power in one word. Good morning. Happy Valentine's Day. There's a lot of red here today. I like that. Well, we're in the second week of a series that we began last week. We're calling from this day forward. And, and for those of you that are single, the goal of this series is to invest in your lives, invest in your relationships, that, that as you prepare for marriage or prepare for a relationship for the future, that God would use this to shape you and encourage you and bless you, and that, that you can start putting things in place in your life to have a successful future uh, with someone if God leads that uh, direction in your life. For those of us that are married, my goal in this series, what we're trying to do is invest in our series, learn some skills, remember some skills, and come back and strengthen some commitments that we have that literally will, will help us, will fail-proof our marriage, will, will give us a longevity and a strength that other people don't have. If we live like everybody else, we're going to have what they have, but if we live like God wants us to live, we will have what He wants us to have. And so we've been talking about five commitments, five commitments that we make in marriage, in a relationship that are going to help us, that God's purpose and plan for us. And I shared them with you last week. Last week, we talked about seeking God. And so five commitments, seek God, fight fair, have fun. Do you remember the fourth one? Stay pure. And the last one, never give up. Would you say those with me? Seek God, fight fair, have fun, stay pure, and never give up. So we're going to seek God. We're going to fight fair we're going to have fun together, isn't that great? We're going to stay pure, and we are going to never, ever give up. Tonight, we have a very special service, and I invite every one of you to come back, and, and I hope that you'll participate. We're going to have a renewal of vows service, and we haven't done this before, and what a privilege to do this on Valentine's night at 6 o'clock right here Come dress, come ready. You may have to bring a little gift for your special someone, your wife, your husband. But we're going to meet in here and have a renewal service. We're going to invite couples to come forward, renew their vows. And then afterwards, we're going to have a reception in the atrium. And Mary Beeler has prepared a wedding cake, a beautiful tiered wedding cake. And it is going to be a wonderful, wonderful evening. So I hope that you will take part. You didn't have to sign up. This is an honor system. Y'all just come and we'll make room for you. But it's going to be a wonderful time. And we invite you, friends, family, to come and support those that are going to renew their vows tonight. Now, I don't know what the weather's going to be like. It's a little misty. It's a little cool outside. But one way or the other, Paul and I are going to be here. So we hope that you'll come. We want you to be safe. But I believe it's going to be good weather and we're going to be able to make it. That's my, I'm speaking in faith there tonight. Well, we talked about seeking God uh, last week, and, and the, the challenge that I made to you is in your relationship with your spouse to pray every day with each other. It might be just a simple prayer. It might be at breakfast, what Paul and I do each morning. We come together, we have breakfast, and we pray for one another at our breakfast time before we go out for the day. It might be at night. It might be during the day. You might text each other. You might send each other an email. Just any way that you can communicate with each other and pray for one another. 
And if you're single, what an opportunity to pray for marriages, pray for your parents, pray for your future spouse if you're young and looking towards getting married someday, uh, praying for your kids and their marriage. But every day, seeking God's presence in our relationships in our life. Today, I want to talk to you about fighting fair. I want to talk to you about the conflict that the fact is every one of us have some sort of conflict in our life sooner or later. Every relationship does. But our commitment today that we want to make is not only to seek God and to pray for one another, but our commitment is that I commit to fight fair. Would you say that with me? I commit to fight fair. Now, you may be married, you may be single, but you're going to have conflict in relationship. And the commitment we need to make, according to Scripture, is that I, me, commit, I make a promise, I make a faith promise, I make a goal, I, I set it in motion. I commit to fight fair. Don't stop with I commit to fight. Don't stop there. Some of you have done that. I commit to fight. But, but it's I commit to Because the truth is we're all going to fight. We're going to have arguments. I mean, you can't grow up in a family without having arguments with your parents, with your siblings, with somebody. You're going to fight. But when you fight, fight fair. I commit to fight fair. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever had a fight with somebody over the silliest, most insignificant thing? Just raise your hand. Have you ever had a fight with somebody? I would say we're part of the human race here. I would say that we're right on target. We fought over insignificant things, little things, and, and, and we... So did you have a fight coming to church today? Are you sitting by yourself today because of it? You know, over the years, Paul and I, my wife, Paul and I, shared um, a number of arguments and fights and conflicts. And and to be honest, most of them have been over insignificant things. I mean, we've, one of us have just, been, our mood's been off, and somebody says something, they said it in a way that just ticked us off, it just offended us, or, or in a time that wasn't right, and we just, we just had a conflict. And, and it's important to resolve and reconcile those conflicts. Matter of fact, this week, uh, just this last week, Paula came crawling to me on her hands and knees. And it was after a fight, and she crawled to me and said, Get out from underneath that bed, you coward. <laughs> fight like a man. And we, we resolved that conflict. You know, the reality is every one of us have conflicts. We all have issues that come up in our life. And, and why? Why do we have conflicts? And I need to be really honest, and I have a hard time even saying this, but, but the truth is we are sinners. We are sinners. Now, we are people of grace when we belong to Jesus Christ, and we don't live in sin. That's the goal. That's the plan. But the fact is, there's a fallen nature. And until we get to heaven, we're going to fight against that fallen nature. And that fallen nature will lead us, will tempt us, will maneuver us, will manipulate us in our own selfishness, in our own desire to be the boss, to get ahead, to be the victor. It's going to lead us into having conflict with other people. You're in my space. You're taking some territory. You're, you're doing, I was playing with a child this week, and, and then my grandson was upset because I was playing with another child. And I said, are you, are you jealous? Yes, I'm jealous. His mom came to pick him up, and, and first thing he says to her, Mom, I'm jealous. There's going to be conflict. There, there's going to be difficulty, and the question is, are we going to handle it in a healthy way, or are we going to handle it in an unhealthy way? Because the truth is, healthy people, healthy couples fight fair. Unhealthy people, they fight unhealthy. They fight dirty. They have sucker punches. They hit under the belt. They, they, they accuse. They, they demand. They, they manipulate. But healthy couples fight for resolution. And if you can kind of think this concept, when we're fighting unhealthy, we're fighting against one another. We're fighting that we can be the victor, we can be the winner, but when we're fighting in a healthy way, we're fighting for each other. And sometimes you need to have a conflict, you need to have an argument, you need to work through to get on the same page, and you don't just walk off, you don't just hide it, you don't just sweep it under the carpet, you deal with it. Why? Because the relationship is so important. 
This is the most important thing I can do, and I'm going to fight for you. I'm not going to fight with you. I'm going to fight for you that we can resolve this and we can get victory over this issue that we don't have to keep coming back to it over and over and over again. There's a fascinating study by Dr. John Gottman. Now, he is a leading marriage specialist, a therapist, and, and has written extensively on marriage. And matter of fact, he is probably the most quoted marriage specialist in the world. He has done so much research of following couples for decades, and he says that within a 91% chance, he can dis- figure out, he can estimate, he can decide by the study he's done, he can claim that he can determine with a 91% accuracy whether a couple will divorce or not divorce. He says he can do this in five minutes. Five minutes. That's kind of scary, isn't it? To meet somebody in five minutes, be able to talk with you and see where you're going with life and where you're not going with life. Because what he discovers is that it's not The question is not if you have a conflict or if you have a fight. The question is, is how you fight. How do you fight with one another? How do you work towards resolution? It's not if, it's how. And the Bible verse that we're going to talk about today is is a powerful Bible verse. And I need to tell you, you're going, well, Pastor, you know, you're talking about marriage and you're talking about what psychologists say or maybe a therapist. Is this really what we need to talk about in church? Yes, it is, because this is straight from the Scripture. This is biblical. This is where we live. And in James chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, turn over there. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, but we're going to look at verse 19. And it is so powerful. Would you stand with me in honor of God's Word? And I'd like you to Follow along or read it with me. Mark it in your Bible because this is some guidelines. These are some rules that God lays out for us. And I believe this. This is a biblical verse inspired by the Holy Spirit, spoken to the people of God that teaches us that we can have healing and hope and wholeness in our relationships and don't have to fight dirty. We can fight fair. Listen to these words. Everyone should be quick to listen. Did you hear that? Everyone should be quick to listen. Say this with me, matter of fact. Are you listening to me? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God deserves. Now, I know that we live in a, in a world that we're, we're very aware when we use the word man or woman or male and female. But in the understanding of Scripture, when we're saying man, we're talking about the human race. We're talking about all people here. All people. Everyone should be quick to listen. You, me, the, the guy down the street, the woman down the street, the teenager, the child, the senior adult. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Not slow in your speech, but slow to speak to speak, and slow to become angry. For a man, for a person, for a man and a wife, for a woman and a man, for a boy and a girl, for a teenager, their anger does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. May God bless His Word. You may be seated. How to fight fair and not fight dirty. Simple message. Simple insight but don't overlook the, the, the meaning behind the message because of the simplicity of the structure. First point is this. God has rules in your life and in my life when it comes to dealing with conflict, when it comes to fighting fair. First rule is this. First of all, we need to stop to listen carefully. Now, let me give a little disclaimer here. I've got some wedding pictures up on this screen. I am not in any way saying that these people have conflict. (laughs) And when it comes up and it talks about contempt and criticism, and I have a picture up there, that is not a living illustration. Okay? This is just a way to just 
I wanted to leave them off, but I wanted to show them to you too. So if you'll just separate the pictures from the comments, we'll be fine. I did have some people last week say, Pastor, I didn't listen to a word you say because I was trying to figure out who those people were. (laughs) Well, you better listen today because I put their names up there, okay? So the first thing, the first direction that the God's Word says that I need to stop to listen carefully, right there in that verse, Everyone should be what? Quick to listen. But we're often quick to what? Speak. Have our way uh, made known to argue back, to fight for victory, to to throw in that low blow. Oh, I'm going to get the last word in as if I have to say it as I slam the door on the way out. We're not quick to listen. And and I don't know about you, but I I have a little bit of ADHD. Uh, I'm kind of jump around a little bit in my conversations. I'm a random thinker. I could talk about this, and I'll talk about this, and I'll talk about this, and I'll come back and talk about this again, and a little bit of this, and, a little, and it's a little confusing sometimes. That's the reason I put an outline in your bulletin so I, have, I can follow, right? That's the reason I follow a little kind of uh, some guidelines up here so I don't go off on some tangent and never find my way back because I can do that. But I love, you know, when I came home, example, I came home last night. And sometimes Paula and I have a conversation, and, and I get frustrated in the conversation. I, I actually get angry, and probably we have a little bit of a fight, because she'll say, well, how was your day? And I'll say how my day was, and I'll get about three or four words out and say, this is what I did. And then she'll say, well, you should have done this, and you should have done this, and why didn't you do this, and did you get this? I haven't finished talking yet. I came home last night, I'd been at the church studying and working, I had to do some things here, and I was exhausted. I came home, took a shower, and she came in, and we were talking, and, and it was interesting. She said, how was your day? What'd you do? And so I began to tell her there was no interruption whatsoever. It was amazing. And I just talked and talked and talked, and it was telling her what I was doing and where I was going and, and who I met with and what I said. It was amazing. It was wonderful. It was kind of like I kept opening the shower door. Are you in there? She'd shake her head, yes. I'm going, This is crazy. So I finished my shower, I got out drive, I said, so, so do you have anything to say to me? And he, she goes, well, why not? She says, well, I can't talk. <laughs> I thought we'd made some progress. <laughs> Quick to listen. Quick to listen. And, and when we get in an argument and a fight, we need to... We need to stop, we need to step back for just a moment and and really try to focus on what the other person's saying. Here's what the Bible says about when we don't do this. Proverbs 18. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding but delights in airing his own opinions. A fool. A fool is like this. I I really don't care what you have to say, but but if you'll hurry up and finish, then I'll get to say what I want to say. Do you ever find yourself when somebody's talking, your spouse is talking, your, your kids are talking, that you're formulating your response to the first thing they've said, but you have no clue of what they're continuing to talk about because you're not listening. You're not, you're not hearing them. And the Scripture says that is foolish. In seminary, I, I had to take a couple of classes in pastoral counseling and, and marriage counseling. So they, in, a, in just a, a three-hour class, they try to put everything, cram it all in so you become an expert, you know, in that one little class that you take to help you the rest of your ministry. But I I remember very specifically two things in this class when it talked about counseling couples, counseling people in in marriage conflicts and relational conflicts. And I remember very simple that, that it said we should, when we get into a conflict, help the couple or ourselves, we need to repeat back to the person what we just heard them say. First step. There's a conflict. You don't like what I'm doing. I don't like what you're doing. Something happened here. What I do is I stop to listen, and the first thing I do is I repeat back to you what I heard you just say. And I'll tell you what's fascinating about that is when you repeat back to the person what you just heard, 99% of the time they'll say, I didn't say that. You're not listening. Okay, well, say it again. And then you repeat back to them, I heard you say, blah, blah, blah. Use the same words, the same description. You say, well, that's silly. They know what they said. 
Well, that's true, but do you know what they said? Then say it in the words that you're hearing. You know, guys hear differently than women. Did you, if you figured that out? I mean, my wife can say something. She knows exactly what she's talking about. It is a foreign language to me. I'll take it a completely different way than the way she meant it. And I'll say something, and it's a foreign language. To her, so we have to interpret to one another. When I said this, I meant this. And so the easy way to interpret is just what I, what I learned was to come back in a relationship and say, I heard you say this. Is that what you said? No, that's not what I said. Well, say it again in a different way. Okay, da, da, da. are you hearing me now? Well, let me try it again. I heard you say this. What it does is it validates that we're even paying attention. It validates that this person is important enough to listen to. Now, I may disagree completely with what she's saying. She may disagree completely with what I'm saying. But the question is, am I listening? Am I hearing her? Second thing I remember us talking about in the class, not only validate that you're listening and that you can repeat back, I heard you say this, validate secondly the person's feelings. I heard you say this, and I sense that you're feeling this way, or you say that you're feeling this way. Is that right? I see that I've, I've hurt you. I've wounded you. You're feeling, you're feeling deserted, or you're feeling like I don't care. You're, you're feeling frustrated. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. See, what you're doing is you're, you're acknowledging that this other person is a human being. And you're acknowledging that they have emotions and they have feelings and, and this could be with a parent and a child. It could be with a brother and sister. It could, but especially in a marriage relationship to validate that you may completely disagree with their feelings. Well, you shouldn't feel that way. You ever said that? You ever had somebody say that to you? Well, don't think what you're thinking and don't feel what you're feeling and surely don't tell anybody about it. That's dysfunction. Healthy says, I hear what you're saying. I understand how you're feeling. Now let me respond to those feelings. Not just because the fact is it's opinion. You can't fight with opinion. You can't fight with feelings. If a person's feeling something, they're feeling it. And you can tell them all day long, no, you shouldn't feel that way or don't feel that way. It doesn't change anything. You acknowledge they're talking, what they're saying, how they're describing it, and you acknowledge, you validate that you're listening, and you validate that you understand how they feel. And you don't take it as an attack. You don't, you see, our problem too often is we think, well, I know what they're talking about. I know what they're saying. I know what they're trying to communicate. When the fact is, we don't have a clue. We need to listen. We need to be slow to speak. Proverbs 18, 17 says, any story sounds true until someone else tells the other side and sets the record straight. Well, that's the what I thought. Well, until you talk with somebody else about it, what you think may be wrong. So we stop to listen. What are you saying? I, I value what you're saying, but I also value how does that make you feel? Second thing, Scripture tells us not only to, to listen carefully, the second thing is to guard your words carefully. Guard your words carefully. Guard your words. You know what? Change that to faithfully. Change that word to carefully to faithfully. Guard your words faithfully. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Proverbs verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 23 says this. I love this passage. It says, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. <laughs> Maybe that ought to be a life verse, you know? Watch your tongue, keep your mouth shut, and stay out of trouble. It's like the old adage is, uh, you know, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remo remove all doubt. Right? Watch your tongue, keep your mouth shut, and stay out of trouble. Not a great verse to use when you're in an argument. I mean, don't, don't use it there, but, but a great verse. Watch your mouth, keep your mouth shut, and, and what it does is it forces you when, you, when you're in an argument, you, you guard your words faithfully this way. 
Ask yourself two questions. You might want to write these questions down. Should it be said? Should what I'm going to say be said at all? What I'm about to say, should I really say it? Or am I just taking a low blow? Am I just trying to hurt somebody? Am I just trying to get my way and let them know how terrible they are? Should it be said? The second question is this. Should it be said now? Sometimes it needs to be said. The fact is you need to bring up new information, but don't bring up new information in an old fight. Deal with the old fight. Don't bring up a fight when somebody's going out the door to go to work or they're trying to go to bed. Set a time that you're going to talk about issues and work through issues. Should it be said? Should it be said? Well, yeah, I just can't believe you, you leave the dishes out and you leave everything so dirty and you're arguing with them as they're trying to get out the door to go to an appointment. Should it be said? Secondly, should it be said now? Stay focused on the issues. Fight fair, not unhealthy. And one of the most practical tips I remember hearing in this class was this, is that when you have, a, when you have opportunity, set aside some time, could be 30 minutes, could be an hour, could be 15 minutes, and ask two questions to each other. Not only when you're questioning whether I should say it or should it be said now, but when you have an opportunity, get together in a non-conflict time and do a marital checkup, do a relationship checkup. And, and here's a question. What are three things that I do that bless you? Now, some of you are saying, three things? I can't even think of one thing. What are three things that I do that bless you? You can come up with something. I mean, it may be putting the car in the garage or getting gas or, or getting the bank deposit or feeding the dog or mowing. The, you're going to come up with something. Three things that bless you. And what that does is it creates a positive momentum to get things to move forward. And, when, and words of encouragement will help you in, in strengthen that relationship. And then you'll know better how to be helpful. Second question is this. What are three things I could do that would be even a bigger blessing. And what that does, surprisingly, is it gives permission for the other person to be able to bring up some issues that maybe need to be dealt with. Could you put the toilet seat back down? Could you pick up your underwear? Could you, you know, and all of a sudden there's some things that, that you're thinking, well, that's not a big deal, but it's a big deal to your spouse. It's a big deal to your parents. It's a big deal to, to, to your, your friend there, that, that your roommate, that, that, that this needs to be dealt with. And what it does is it creates a, a safe context in a non-conflict environment to bring up some issues. How, give me three ways that, that I bless you. List them out. Good, positive momentum. How about this? How are three things that I could do to bless you even more? And then I know kind of what some expectations. I know what I could be done. Should it be said and should it be said now? We're going to get in conflicts. We're going to have difficulties. And the Scripture says that. There's no doubt that we're going to have a problem. The question is, how are we going to fight during that conflict? Let me give you some rules. Not only these things, being quick to listen and slow to speak, but, but I think these are very helpful. S- establishing some, some values, some, some guidelines. And even if you're single, to say, I'm going to put some things in place that I'm going to have certain parameters that I'm going to follow and not... I'm not going to do these things, or I'm going to do these things. First thing is this, no name calling. Don't call names. Unless it's like uh, schnooky, hooky, baby, sweet thing, you, you know. Proverbs 12 says, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You know, too often we say words, and words cannot come back. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he spoke the earth into being. He, he spoke. And, and what we do often with our words, the Bible says the tongue has the power of life and death. And with our words, we often speak death into a person's life. We speak hurt. We speak woundedness. And so guard your words. Never use names. Call names. Second is this. Don't, don't raise your voice in shouting. Don't, don't yell at one another. 
Step back, count to 10, breathe in, sing a song, say a prayer, say 14 prayers, whatever you do, calm down. But there's no reason to, because you can't take it back once again. The third thing is this, never get historical. Now, I know you're thinking hysterical. That's, that was number two. But never get historical because some of us are really good at that. That we're, dealing, we're trying to deal with the issue at hand, but instead of that, we go back to 1864 and bring up everything that's happened every day since then. And we become these great historians. And, and, and the other members of your, of your home, is just, they're, just, they're, they're deer in headlights going, what just hit me? Because I'm trying to deal with this issue and you're bringing up all the stuff of the past. Don't be historical. Fourth is never say never. That's a silly thing. Never say never. never. I, I learned a long time ago, I don't ever say never to God. I told the Lord I would never go to California and pastor and never, never be a part of a church in California. Those, I mean, that's going to fall off the edge of the earth one day. You know, it's it's going to be gone. And where did I go from my first senior pastor? California. Never say never. But what, in a conversation when you're talking to each other, how we use that as a weapon. You never or you always really Never? You never pick up after yourself. Really? You never clean up. You never do this. You, really? You see, it's a lie. Never say never and never say, well, you always, you know, bring your mother up or you always do. No, you don't. Fourth one is, or fifth one is this, never threaten divorce. If I can encourage you in, in one way, whenever you're as a couple and you're, or your kids, when your kids start talking up divorce, you just shut them down. I don't want to hear it. You know, you got yourself in this mess, you get yourself out of it. It's not my business. Don't you even threaten. Don't you talk bad about your, my daughter-in-law or my son-in-law because I'm on your side. I'm for you. I'm not against you. But in a marriage relationship, as soon as you bring divorce out and put it on the table, it becomes an option. You begin, I remember sitting in my office and counseling with a couple, and they got so conflicted. They, got, they had such a fight together. I'm trying to calm them down. And one of the spouses brings up the idea, well, you just want a divorce, don't you? No, I don't want a divorce. Well, you just want a divorce, don't you? No, I don't want a divorce. You just want a divorce, don't you? Yes, I want a divorce. I got a divorce. I wonder what would have happened if they would have not even put it on the table and said, you want to work this thing through, don't you? Yes, I do. But we kill ourselves. It's the old adage, you've heard this, say what you mean and mean what you say. If you don't mean it, don't say it. Don't say it. And here's the last one, a little guideline. When you're in a fight, never quote your pastor <laughs> or your mother. Never quote your pastor. Don't ever do it. Leave me out of it. You got yourself into it. You get yourself out of it. Don't bring me into it. So stop to listen carefully. Guard your words faithfully. And the third one is this. Oh, am I not clicking these? You didn't get to see these beautiful pictures. Do you know who that is? That's Pastor Kathy. Oh. Handle your anger righteously. Everyone should be, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. The truth is, if you do the first two, the third one comes pretty natural. If you'll listen, if you'll s s be slow in your speech, if you'll just kind of step it back a little bit, you're going to find yourself that you don't accelerate so quickly into being upset. And sometimes to have a great marriage, you, you know, sometimes you just got to tell yourself, this is not worth it. This argument, this fight that we're going into, it's not worth it. I've just got to let it go. You could start singing that song. Let it go, let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. I mean, not, not let it go like, but let it go like, let this thing go. Be slow to anger. I love Ephesians chapter 4. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Do not let the sun go down while you're angry. Do you know that you can get angry? You can get upset. You can get mad and it not be a sin. 
It's what you do with that anger. It's how you explode with it. It's the residue of that anger. And the issue, he says, in your anger, do not sin. I love what he says. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And here's what I want you to think about. Anytime you go to bed angry, unresolved issues, you just gave the devil a foothold into your marriage. You just gave the devil a foothold into your relationship, into your heart. Because when you wake up in the morning, it hasn't gone away. You just smoothed it over. Your emotions may be down, but the issue's still there. And it's going to grow and and seethe like a cancer. And you've got to deal with it. You've got to lance it open. You don't just push it down. You deal with it. You face it. And I'm telling you that, that where you are right now, you're not there because of one issue. You're there because you... You've put things underneath the carpet for years and years and years. And, and the scripture says so wisely, don't let the sun go down on your, on your anger. Don't go to bed mad or with unresolved issues. Don't give the devil a foothold in that relationship. Why? Because it's so important to resolve. And maybe the resolution would be, you know what, this is so important. And we're going to address this, but we're so exhausted tonight. And we're going to meet tomorrow and we're going to talk this thing through. We're not going to ignore it. But right now, we're going to take a time out. That's not bad. That's healthy. But to ignore it and sweep it under the carpet and never address it is unhealthy. Paul and I made an agreement when we first got married. Because, you know, I'm I'm high strung. uh, She's passionate. And we've had a number of conflicts. And she's always been right. I recognize that. Um, but we've had a number of conflicts, but we made, a, we made a promise to one another that we would not go to bed angry. We would not go to bed mad. Oh, we may have to set up and, and fight it through, and sometimes we haven't gone to sleep for like five years. I mean, it's been, it's been amazing and you, that you can do that. But, but we made that resolution that we're not going to go to sleep angry. We're going to work it through. And and sometimes it's hard to forgive. You know, sometimes it's hard to work through those issues. But my relationship with her is worth it. And my kids are worth it. And you're worth it. And my relationship with God is worth it. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let sin get a foothold. The devil get a foothold. Ephesians 4.31 says this. Stop being mean. Bad tempered and angry, quarreling, harsh words, and dislike of others should have no place in your life. You know, if we're seeking God, if we're saying, God, I wanna, I wanna seek, I'm committing to follow you, I'm committing to do what you want me to do, and I'm gonna pray every day for my spouse, and I'm not gonna pray, God, change them, I'm gonna pray, God, change me, that I can be the man that brings out the best in my wife, or I can be the woman that brings the best out in my husband, that I could be the parent that brings the best out in my kids, or I can be the kids that brings the best out in my parents. I can be the friend that brings the best out in my... I'm, I'm gonna, God, help me to be who you've called me to be because I'm only responsible for me. I can't change them, but I can change me. And that if I'm seeking you and I'm praying every day, with my spouse, for my spouse, about my spouse, my family, then all of a sudden, things begin to change. Maybe in the way I'm looking, the way I'm talking, the way I'm responding. And that brings a change into the life of the other person. And instead of reacting, we respond. And instead of fighting to win, we fight to resolve. And we don't let the devil get a foothold in our lives, that he creates a stronghold. We learn to hold back our words. We we learn to guard our tongue and and ask, should it be said at all? You know what the truth is? That doesn't need to be said. I can't take it back. Or or should it maybe it does need to be said. The fact is it does need to be said, but I'm gonna do a better time to say it. Where it really can make a difference and not just be a weapon. That we all have some level of conflict. We all have some level of struggle. Gottman goes on and he talks about what he calls the four horsemen in conflict. And and here they are very quickly. I put them on your outline. Criticizing. That when we criticize one another, that that when when we point out the negativity, hey, you told me you were going to do this and you didn't do it. I I wish you would have done it. That's complaining. Criticizing is you never do what you say you're going to do. That's criticizing. And when when you... 
find a relationship that has a continual critical spirit, you're finding a relationship that's spiraling down. Second thing he says on this, this way of four signs that you're not fighting fair, criticizing the other one is contempt. Eyes rolling, sarcasm. When you are uh, saying negative things, you know, I don't even like you. I don't even know why I'm with you. And, and we say these, these hurtful things, it's contempt. For, a third thing he talks about is defensiveness. Defensiveness. That, and, and I see this all the time. You do it, I do it. Well, it's your fault. You did this, or, or it's their fault. I didn't do this. It's not my fault. You know, you're a jerk. You've got the spiritual gift of being a jerk. You know, you, you just, you, you, you just and, and it takes two of us, really. And fourth is this. It's called stonewalling, he talks about. It's when we put up our hand and we say, I'm done. I don't care what. I'm over. It's over. I'm not dealing with this anymore. And he says, these are signs that our relationship's going down. These are signs that are going to that are going to bring the demise of, of everything that you hold is important and sacred, and but if you take time to seek God and to seek Him with one another and to pray for one another and to 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 make a commitment to fight fair, that we're going to instead of fighting with each other, we're going to fight for each other. Instead of fighting against one another, we're going to fight for the relationship. That, that we're going to we're going to fight fair, and we're going to certain have certain ground rules in place. That there's going to be no name calling, and and there's not going to be any accusations. And we're just going to make sure we're very clear. And when we get off sides, we're going to say time out. And when there's a penalty, we'll say time out. We'll go to the penalty box or whatever it is. And we're going to establish this thing to move forward and to fight fair for resolution. Whether you're married or not, the challenge that every one of us face is that in our relationship, there's going to be conflict. But in the midst of that conflict, that we've already made the decision that I want to be godly. I, I want to I be godly in how I handle that conflict. I want to be quick to listen. I, I want to be slow to speak. I want to be slow to become angry. And I'm going to handle my anger righteously. I want to grow in my ability to be the person that God wants me to be in relationship. Because relationships matter. They mirror to others what our relationship is with God. They mirror to the world what our, the relationship is of Christ and the church. And so we listen. We choose our words carefully. We deal with our anger properly. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you that it never returns void until it accomplishes all that you have for it. And so would you work on us that, God, we wouldn't just react in the flesh, but we would respond by your spirit. Father, that you'd give us a hope, that you'd give us healing, that you'd bring restoration and you'd bring forgiveness today as we pray. Lord, I pray, pray especially for those that are married. And that's where there needs to be grace and forgiveness and mercy. Where there's, where there's hurt, may there, may there be hope. Where there's Bitterness, can there be healing, Lord? I pray for those that are feeling like they're on the edge and they're just struggling, they can't make it, that they would know your presence and your peace, and that through your word and your spirit that you would help them to see that all things are possible in Christ. Lord, we commit to seek you. We commit to fight fair in our relationships and our marriage for your glory from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder, don't miss out on tonight, an opportunity to renew your vows, but also to come and support those who are renewing their vows. Part of being the body of Christ is supporting each other, walking alongside each other, because it's so important that we recognize each other's marriages and our role within them. Also, this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock, it'll be here in the sanctuary, we're going to be meeting Continuing the process of Church Unique, our team will have met all day long, so we might be a little tired, give us a little bit of grace, but we're going to be presenting values and different things. You want to be there. You want to see 
what the team has come up with because ultimately, while the team has done a lot of work, it's up to us as the church to accept it and to roll with it. And so we need your opinion. We, we want to hear from you. Your voice is valuable and needed. And so Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, be here in the sanctuary and we'll be going over that. So today, I know we've been fighting about talking fair, fighting fair, guys. Today would probably not be a day to fight at all. Just going to throw that out there. But go in peace and serve the Lord and all God's people said, amen.